Hello, everybody, and welcome to the continuity report for August 24th, 2024. It's season one, episode 33. Today, we're going to be talking about a mystery murder mystery cast on Netflix, a Western thriller on Netflix, a 1981 fantasy movie on Prime, a Transformer movie for kids, a Stephen King adaptation of horror toy story. TV sets are now digital billboards. The Rainmaker on USA Network shows that should return to Nickelodeon. Alien continues to mutate. Frozen 3 and 4 are being made together. And I am Merwat, and that is the sentient AI's visualizer and their voice from on high. Good evening, hometown citizens. Welcome to the Continuity Report. We have all 10 of our articles for today all set up. So let's go knock them down. But remember, everything is powered by hometown.com. Be sure to go over, sign up, become a citizen, follow us, like, subscribe, ring the bell, send the carrier pigeon, everything over on YouTube. Follow us on Twitch. There's a Patreon, Discord, download the podcasts. There's six weekly shows and one daily show. You already missed non sequitur news, so you have to go back 1,100 episodes. That's right. All right, folks. Remember, there's a test at the end of this. Let's get into the very first article. This murder mystery cast is so good, it could become Netflix's Netflix sign? Net- Most definitely. Well, anyway, their biggest movie franchise yet. Netflix has had many hits and misses with its original movies, but one of its upcoming murder mystery movies has the potential to become its biggest movie franchise thanks to its incredible cast. Netflix has an interesting list of upcoming movies under its category of Netflix originals, and among them is The Thursday Murder Club. The Thursday Murder Club. Sorry, I get carried away. Uh, This British crime comedy is based on the 2020 novel by the same name by Richard Osman, and it's directed by Chris Columbus. The Thursday Murder Club will be joining Netflix's... Hold on. It's extensive catalog of crime content. And it has great potential. And lots of zzz. I have wasps. Um, I mean, they're outside, but they're on in my brain, you know? So when Netflix is... is, is uh, it's just, oh, God. Anyway, so Adrian Tyler over at... Uh, Screen Rant, I think it's called Screen Rant. Is that the name of the website? Screen. That would be. Okay. So it's over at ScreenRant.com. That's where we source this from. Uh, I won't read the whole thing. That's not how it works here in Omtown. But if you want to get all the show notes, then you can hit exclamation point TCR and that will pull all of today's articles from uh, Omatron. And if you want all of the show notes syntax for all of the shows that we put together, you can hit exclamation point show net, uh, show notes, sorry, show notes. Don't show anything else. And if you want the podcast, you hit exclamation point pod. And that will post that into the um, VOD as well. You can download the pods by clicking on the VODs links. Got it? All right. Anyway, the Thursday Murder Club has an incredible cast, including Helen Mirren, Pierce Brosnan, Ben Kingsley, and Celia Emery. With a successful novel behind it, Steven Spielberg's involvement, it has the potential to be Netflix's. Is, 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 uh, it's happening. AI, help, help. Anyway, I know. I think the wasp must be visiting. Biggest movie franchise, the murder mysteries. Uh, amateur sleuths have drawn comparisons to *Knives Out*, promising a mix of comedy and intrigue. 
boom we need to set that up sold <laughs> yep exactly so although knives out and glass onion in particular is a documentary about real life events <laughs> kind of like a demolition man has predicted the future and that taco bell will win the fast food wars we don't talk about it all that much but it is canon here in hometown the thursday murder club takes the audience to a retirement village where four septuagenarians uh, septuagenarian friends meet up at least once a week to look at and investigate unsolved murders the friends call themselves the thursday murder club this ah uh, sounds like only murders in the building a little bit right huh but it's from a 2020 novel oh fascinating right yeah yeah that's what you said that's what it says but that's what it says so hmm it's really new all right anyway i think that this is gonna be a great watch so if you've never heard of this i'm or i i'm pretty sure that if you have heard of this and you're watching this show you're probably going where the hell have you two been <laughs> well the sentient ai has been trying to hunt down their terminator body and i've been running hometown so we don't get out much i mean we joke about touching grass but we really want to touch grass anyway thursday murder club's cast is ridiculously stacked they say um I, we really don't need to go through all of this do we i mean uh, it's pretty much done. i mean we just need to say who's in the cast i think but we did right right there you said um helen mirren i think helen Pierce mirren Brosnan, yeah ben kingsley Celia amory i mean i have to admit this does have a quite the cast from that that this listing but amazing. then Jonathan Price, it looks like. Um, David Tennant, Richard Grant, Tom Ellis. I don't know who all these people are. Daniel Mays, etc. Interesting. Henry Lloyd Hughes, Paul Fremen. Um, all of them in currently undisclosed roles. The main cast ha have impressive filmographies that cover a variety of genres. Grant, Tennant, Ellis who have shown their acting range in comedy, mystery, thriller, and more over the years. But this is a movie. And that's the difference. Yeah, it seems like it'd be a... Well, Knives Out is, right? And this is... Oh, no. I thought this was going to be an ongoing show. No, really? I thought it's a movie. You're right, it is a movie. It just strikes me as a, a show. But it could be a franchise. I guess is the riff here. Right. But, Cause they could come out with other movies similar to how knives out has. Yeah. This is precariously close to only murders in the building, which is quite the watch. It is fun. So it's, if it's similar with different personalities, it might work. Yeah. And it's starting season four. Wow. All right. Moving on. Next article is over in the continuity report. This Western thriller with 100% on Rotten Tomatoes is now on Netflix and season three is already on the way. So recently, Netflix put a number of new television series on their service, including a successful Western thriller called Dark Winds. Westerns have long been a popular genre, originating when Americans began migrating out west during the 1800s in search of gold and land. Over the years, Westerns have uh, seen a rise and a fall in popularity. I think the, pre the penultimate Western is Blazing Saddles. And the ultimate is um, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I think that's fair. Something of that caliber, I guess, would be right. Probably anything with John Wayne would be considered right, one of see. the pinnacles. I guess that's... Hmm. Hmm. Because it says in the Southwest during the Civil War. 
I must not remember the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I've seen it. Okay, I thought that was a western. Yeah. So, focus. Um, so I've it's been a, a spaghetti fan of, western. I'm sorry. It's a spaghetti western. Yeah, but anyway, it has a 97 Rotten Tomato on it. So the thing about westerns is I I really dig westerns. I like modern westerns, and if this is a riff off of that, you know, modern filmography. Um, cinematography, uh, everything is actually played as modern, then I think I'll love this. But this is a Western thriller. So it just kind of sounds intriguing. Um, Megan Hemingway over at ScreenRant.com put the article together. Darkwind's success lies in its diverse storytelling that centers on Native American characters, providing a gripping and honest narrative. For the promising season three in production, Dark Winds continues to break new ground in Western television, attracting critical acclaim. Western television series like Dark Winds offer a fresh take on the genre's traditional themes of good versus evil and complex protagonists. Um, so over the years, Westerns have seen that rise and fall. The legends like John Wayne and Clint Eastwood informing the future of the genre these days. Yellowstone, Outer Range, Westworld, Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid was cool. Um, I didn't watch Outer Range, didn't watch Yellowstone. Westworld, I would hazard to include that in anything having to do with. Yellowstone, I think, has quite a following, but I it haven't does. seen that. Yeah. Um, so they say Dark Wind season one and two are now streaming on Netflix and what the show is about. And they say Dark Winds follows two criminal investigations. I think the only part of Dark Winds that I've seen is this. Like, this scene is part of an intro, a trailer. When discussing the best Western shows of the last few years, it's impossible to ignore Dark Winds, which is now streaming on Netflix. They've said this four times now. Dark Winds is based on the Leaphorn and Chi book series by Tony Hillerman, set in the Four Corners area of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah in the 1970s. It follows Joe Leaphorn and Jim Chi, who... Uh, are two Navajo tribal police officers who investigate the murders of two native people. In the midst of their case, Leaphorn and she must also come face to face with the prejudice of the Wild West in their own dark past. This doesn't come across like they're dressed like Western. You know what I'm saying? No, it looks kind of modern, but it, I think it's set in the 70s, right? So... Well, I mean, I guess the 70s, it would have this look, this look. But when I think Western, right. I do not think 70s. Do you think of the 1970s as Western time frame? No. Maybe that's the disconnect. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. So earning 100% on Rotten Tomatoes is no small feat. So many are likely wondering how Dark Winds got such an amazing review. So ultimately it comes down to the show's unique story. Historically, Westerns have centered on white Americans with indigenous people often taking the supporting roles or worse stereotypes. Dark Winds not only turns the tables on that trend, it goes even further. The show centers on native people and gives them a story that is dark, gripping, and honest about the native experience. Overall, this makes Dark Winds stands out from other Westerns. I think the modernity is the one that really kicks it, but they don't seem to mention it in this other than that it takes place in 1970. Exactly. Huh. I mean, that sounds like it could be an interesting watch. Definitely going to have to take a, a gander at it. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it and then we'll end up reporting back out. Um, but oof, I'm going to pause on that video or on that image. Let's move on. Next article is over in the continuity report. So brilliant is the immediate quote. This 1981 fantasy movie that Ridley Scott loves is on Prime Video and it's a must watch. One of Ridley Scott's favorite movies, Blade Runner and Alien director Ridley Scott is one of the cinema's titans. In this film that they love apparently is <laughs> um, everything okay over there? Mm-hmm. I'm waiting um, to see what the movie is. 
So Scott produced the new alien movie, Alien Romulus, released in August 2024. I don't know why they're talking like this in this article, because it still is August 2024. Yeah, it's sad. Remaining a key driver in the franchise and participating in the marketing campaign, Scott's work has influenced countless filmmakers. So what is this brilliant? What the? Christina Truillo is the author of this. Over at ScreenRant.com, Quest for Fire. Have Have you heard of it? it? Yeah, Um, but I never really got into it. So Quest for Fire combines originality with emotional and thrilling moments in the starkly ancient setting. The movie's influence is evident in Hollywood, impacting films like Planet of the Apes and Ridley Scott's own work. Well, of course. Um, So... Quest for Fire is one of Ridley Scott's favorite movies. So what is it about? Um, Well, let's see. (laughs) Do they not actually talk about it? The adventure movie. They talked about it a little below this photo. Follows warring prehistoric tribes. Just it says a prehistoric fantasy adventure based on the 1911 Belgian novel Quest for Fire. Set 80,000 years ago, the movie follows Noah on his mission to obtain fire as a vital resource for his tribe after it was stolen. Ta-da. So why? I think there's a lot. I, it's probably larger than life kind of a thing because um, Quest right, for Fire. Right, makeup. Yeah. Um, so the Ulam granted, uh, grunted and lurched their way through the movie in a way that seemed alien and remote, but strangely familiar. It's a disturbing and gripping adventure that doesn't have many equivalents. Although dated in some aspects, the movie still offers awe-inspiring moments, winning a BAFTA for best makeup, quest for fires, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens e- events in evocative, really, imagining of human, uh, humanity's ancient ancestors. On Noah's adventure through plains, marshes, and woods, he encounters with uh, his encounters with other tribes make up a surprisingly emotional adventure. I I remember this as just being too abstracted for me um, at the time that it was um, released. So, can you see this in Ridley Scott's movies? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know about Blad Runner though. <laughs> that's a knockoff <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah I think um, if I were to watch it now it, this is a 1981 movie so depending on when you were born this thing didn't really land on your radar as something that you would think is interesting some people might I'm, I'm sure but um, yeah not me I'll have to go back and watch this there's some things where you're like okay this has a spectacular rating um i think maybe we should yeah, go that back stands out yeah exactly because nobody did did it say it had a hundred percent rating no that was the that was something else yeah. yeah um but if if you're a fan of ridley scott's work particularly blade runner then yeah you might enjoy this because they like it so why wouldn't you all right let's keep on moving though um the next article is over in the continuity report the first transformer movie for kids is finally here after 30 years of waiting i periodically look back at like um well transformers cartoons and um kind of what what was it called um i just forgot the name of it right when my brain started to work i just forgot of it i forgot Uh, robotech so i loved robotech growing up and i i keep wanting it to come back but they never make anything close to it anymore it seems right this is after 38 years of waiting it's hard to believe that the first transformers movie for kids is finally here the transformer media franchise was first started in 1984 when the Mecha toys from uh, Japanese toy company Takara Tomy um, were introduced into Western markets, what started as a toy line soon got its own animated television and comic book series, followed by the franchise to become a cultural phenomenon. Yes, it did indeed. Um, 
So uh, I had Optimus Prime and I had um, Starscream and um, uh, what is his name? I forgot it. Uh, the one that Bumblebee? Was the, no, I never had Bumblebee. Um, but uh, I had the tape deck that it was a guy that transformed into a tape deck and had um, laser beak as a, a cassette inside him. Uh, and I had just forgot his name, but let's keep going. Uh, Daruv Sharma over at ScreenRant.com put the article together. He transforms into a... Was that Soundwave? Soundwave. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. I wasn't going to be able to sleep until after I went and looked that up. Uh, but yeah, I, Soundwave was my favorite. And uh, he was a Decepticon, so I wasn't really oh. in the Autobots. Uh, so this is the new animation style hyper realistic I don't know how I'll feel about that because we're going to get down at the at, towards the end of the show we're going to talk about five Nickelodeon shows that are that the author oh, wants to okay. bring back I kind of wonder why they're going for this style I mean I get it it's more modern but That's if it. the appeal is in the original animated form couldn't the they just today? make that more modern the only ones that know about the old style are 38 year old plus. That's true. None of the kids would. Yeah. So this is all new. Um, but I'm here for it. You know, I think I'll dig this. It'll be more realistic in terms of like the styling, the, the, the metal true. that makes them up. But there has been more recent versions of the show, um, yes. the TV show, not the movie that are animated. It, that are not just animated, but with a, a different style than the nostalgic animation. And I didn't like the interstitial versions. This one I might like because it it's highly detailed um, and not as cartoony as the ones that you're talking about. Um, and maybe there's other adults out there that grew up with Transformers. Um, now everybody demand Robotech to come back that was that was awesome anyway it's because they had a motorcycle that transformed into exo armor um and that's what i want right now as an adult anyway <laughs> like most michael bay movies the movie is not a critical hit or was not a critical hit however against a budget of 150 million dollars it raked in over 700 million dollars proving the franchise's scope and scalability of live action media since then Many Transformers action movies have seen the light of day, but Transformers 1 is the only animated addition to the series getting a wide theatrical release, despite being an extension of Michael Bay's Transformers movies in more ways than one. Transformers 1 is significantly changing the franchise by landing a PG rating, so it's designed for kids. Which, <laughs> arguably, it should have been all along, but none of the movies have been. Oh no. Uh, all live action Transformers movies have a PG 13 rating, it says. Um, so, all Transformers movies in recent years have had a PG 13 rating, which makes teenagers and adults their targeted audience. The PG 13 rating of Michael Bay's Transformers movies comes from the fact that they're packed with sexual jokes and did not hold themselves back from portraying violent action uh, scenes. But Transformers 1 is getting PG. So it's nixing the 13, stepping it back down um, to your normal cartoon days. So it brings something new to the franchise. Um, its initial trailers hinted at thematic elements suggested that the film would be targeted towards younger audiences. Even animation format of the film made it more suitable for a PG rating. Since nearly all Transformers movies have swung to PG-13 in recent years, it would not have been surprising that Transformers 1 trod that same path. But... The filmmakers behind the movie understood that it would benefit from being more in tandem with the original Transformers animated series. Hey, look at that. Which made for younger audiences and rerun on family cam uh, cable channels like Sci-Fi Channel and The Hub, Discovery, etc. So cool. Um, now I want to go and watch the trailers because I haven't watched any of the trailers. Transformer movies needed to target a broader audience, but... I suppose, you know, adults are going to like this. There might be some adult context jokes that 
won't be picked up like you know bugs bunny in that kind of era right there were right. adult jokes I mean, it's kind of brilliant to get adults on board with the franchise because who's going to be buying the toys, etc. cetera. Um, but it's also like they completely lost their original audience. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, 38 years later or something like that, we're coming up on everybody is in their 50s that watched Transformers when it kicked off. So everybody everybody the adults at the time are their last breath is probably like finally transformers are back <laughs> yeah they can finally go peacefully <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> knowing <laughs> that this is coming all right the next article is over in the continuity report uh, upcoming Stephen King movie adaptation is like the horror spinoff to Toy Story I never knew I needed. Not me, but from Screen Rant, the author says an upcoming movie adaptation of a Stephen King short story comes off uh, as an unofficial spinoff to Toy Story that the author says they never knew they needed. Stephen King's written over 60 books. I got out of bed this morning and dabbled in myriad genres with his knack for fictional storytelling. Traces of his work can be found in pretty much every corner of pop culture. Owing to this, it is not surprising that even the Toy Story movies feature several subtle references to his work. So what is And I did work? not know that. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look. I don't know off the top of my head either, but it's been a long time since I watched any of the Toy Story stuff. Dhruv Sharma over at ScreenRant.com put the article together. The upcoming Stephen King movie adaptation, The Monkey, offers a dark twist on toy characters similar to Toy Story. The cursed symbol banging monkey toy in The Monkey. Bring, I have to say it that way. I'm sorry. It's just how you say monkey. Uh, brings themes of death and fear, contrasting with Toy Story's innocence. While Toy Story portrays toys as symbols of hope and friendship, The Monkey delves into malevolence and the terror through its central toy the monkey <laughs> that's all there really is to say about this <laughs> okay and if I have to look at that through this movie I'm gonna lose my mind there's more than meets the eye to the toy in Stephen King's the monkey it's a sentient toy oh my god they're you know what all of our shows just kind of feed into this creative outlet for people who pay attention because like oh yeah the NaNoWriMo is coming and if you look at any of this stuff it spurs creative juices almost you. every article at every show and today alone, I think there have been several seeds for story ideas. Yeah, and we've done, this is the fourth show for today. So we're kind of, I don't know. Now we just need to convert it into something like a NaNoWriMo man. But hmm. anyway, so while Toy Story uses its toy characters, Monkey, uh, I mean, Toy Story uses it for good. The Monkey, not so much. Um, the monkey's central toy is the opposite of friendly. It's like the, it's, it's evil, evil. So when is it coming out? Does it I say don't it? know if we know. February no, 21st, February. 2025. Wow. Don't set that out there too far away. Did you know that that's when they're going to bring Starliner home? The people from Starliner? Right. I mean, the Starliner crew will be so thrilled they can watch this right when they get back. Well, yeah. And, and they're going to land via the SpaceX rocket, but the Starliner is supposed to automatically land with no occupants. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it says uh, a Toy Story horror spinoff may never happen, but the Stephen King adaptation's dark spin on toy characters offers an exciting alternative. So this is just awesome. 
So I'll end up watching this. I don't know if the sentient AI will disengage their emotion uh, subroutines, but we may need to power down before this movie is aired. Yeah. Even then, that neural network is probably sitting there going, that monkey's staring at me. Moving on. Next article is over on the Wanted channel. Your TV set is becoming a digital billboard and it's only getting worse. Over the past few years, TV makers have been rising financial success from TV operating systems that can show viewer ads and analyze their responses. My primary response is kiss my shiny metal butt. Um, but they never want that in the feedback form. It's never an option. You know, it's one through That's five. It's really weird. Yeah, I don't know. They're obviously not reading the room. Uh, rather than selling as many TVs as possible, brands like LG, Samsung, Roku, and Vizio are increasingly, if not primarily, seeking recurring re revenue from already sold TVs via ad sales and tracking. <coughs> That's why I don't allow these TVs to connect to the network. Yeah, and you have you to be careful of that. Plus, some are marketed for it, kind of with that being very apparent. So the article is over at ArsTechnica.com by Sharon Harding. Uh, the deck statement says TV software is getting loaded with ads, changing what it means to own a TV set. It's basically having a digital billboard in your living room or bedroom or wherever it is that you put a TV. Uh, success in the TV industry used to mean selling as many TVs as possible, but with smart TVs becoming mainstream and hardware margins falling, OEMs have sought new ways to make money. And so now they're making group M the world's largest media investment company reported that smart TV ad revenue grew 20% from 2023 to 2024 and will grow another 20% to reach $46 billion next year. In September, 2023, Patrick Horner, uh, practice leader of consumer electronics at analyst Omdia reported that each new connected TV uh, platform user generates around $5 per quarter in data in advertising revenue. Again, kiss my shiny metal butt. Isn't it nice that in a household, everything about you is worth $5 in a quarter? Oh yeah, we've, we've talked about that often. Yep, yep, yep. Like going out to dinner is 20 bucks per person at, at, at a table. But you are typically worth only $5 a month in ad revenue. And this is actually right. per It's like, quarter. give me a second here. <laughs> yeah. So automatic content recognition uh, technology is at the heart of smart TV ad business. Most TV brands say users can opt out of ACR, but we've already seen Vizio take advantage of the feature without user permission. ACR is also sometimes turned on by default and the off switch is often buried in a menu. Um, including ACR on a TV is all about, uh, uh, at all, says a lot about the TV makers priorities. Most users have almost nothing to gain from ACR and face privacy concerns by sharing information, sometimes in real time, about what they do with their TVs. Again, kiss my shiny metal butt. So when TVs watch you back, so do corporations. Um, there is a device in hometown that has a camera hardwired into it. And guess what it does not do? Share any telemetry. It doesn't see anything because I blinded it permanently. There is no way for it to oh, actually see okay. anything. And the software doesn't even allow you to turn it off or on. It doesn't allow you to access it or acknowledge that it even exists. But I know it's there because of what I do. <laughs> so color me pissed off that I value that piece of technology, but nowhere does it say... Hey, guess what's sitting right here watching you? Um, it, I mean, it's not promoted. And if it does say it somewhere and I missed it, again, color me surprised, but you can actually see it. Anyway, LG recently unveiled the goal of evolving its hardware business into an ad pushing media and entertainment company. Um, expects there to be 300 million WebOS TVs and homes by 2026. That represents a huge data collection and recurring revenue opportunity. In September, 
LG said it would invest 1 trillion KRW kroners, um, right? 737 US dollars, million dollars um, through 2028 into its WebOS business or the business behind its smart TV OSs. And the company said updates will include improving WebOS's UI, AI-based recommendations, and search capabilities. Man, just give me a damn TV that receives a signal. Exactly. I mean, you can't get away from ads anywhere. Now you can't even get away from it in your own house. Yeah, it's just trash. I, I there I, I don't click on ads. You're not selling me on anything your crap is pumping. I'm not interested. You're not like uh, what? You're you're not manipulating me into buying anything. I'm not looking at a Coke ad and going, I'm going to go get a Coke. Maybe I'm an anomaly, but nobody else in hometown is either. So I don't purpose. think a lot of people click on ads or go, Hey, let me go buy that. I honestly don't know do. anybody that clicks on an ad ads on websites and stuff like that are largely there for people to just see it and it becomes part of their awareness either subconsciously or they they go oh my god look at that ad and it, and in some cases i'm like why is that ad on this website next to that topic it's creepy it's weird i'm not interested uh, you know but there's nothing to do you can't do anything about it um except maybe grouse about it with a small group of people that are watching you stream Anyway, um, so the true price of a teep, of a teep, of a cheap TV is that you're being monitored and ads are being sold that qualify and quantify who and what you are doing, watching and who you are. And we've seen this even in the old time where I give it, I give this old school example of how target predicted somebody was pregnant based on the change of their buying habits. Now it was an underage girl and they sent a packet congratulating this underage girl on her pregnancy, sent it to her house, which wasn't her house. It was her parents' house. And her dad got that packet of coupons and was pissed off. And then later found out, oh, guess what's been going on under my roof. Anyway, they had predicted it based on the change in purchase habits. I don't want my TV being able to predict that my goldfish that is you're knocked pregnant. Up, right? <laughs> or that I'm pregnant. I mean, if it can predict that I'm pregnant, I've pretty much won the lottery because anyway, it's kind of impossible. Yeah, I'm really old. Anyway, um, moving off an Android fork, Amazon reportedly started deploying its own OS to run its TVs in November. Amazon Fire TV users are subject to full screen video ads and OS ownership gives Amazon more control and greater potential for earnings over their advertising services. Amazon's advertising business was thought to be its most profitable in 2020 and Fire OS is becoming a bigger part of that. So you're, we're all kind of kind of up a creek because it's going to, as I say to people, you build a better mouse trap, better mice show up. That's what this is. You're going to get an inexpensive TV, but you're going to get ads pushed to you. And if you try and stop it, the service may not work because it's no longer selling, sending telemetry. And because it doesn't get a check back and nobody has hacked the firmware, it may not function until you turn right. off anything that blocks it. And who wants this? I mean, it's already a battle on streaming apps with ads or no ads or paying more. Or... Anyway, um, this is just outrageous. So this article is much longer. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, um, but it, if you are interested in this kind of thing, uh, swing by Ars Technica. You can get there via Omtown, and in the show notes, the link um, is right underneath the... Uh, your TV set has become a digital billboard and it's only getting worse. You can click on visit the source um, and in the show notes over on YouTube um, and the podcast, the link is right there. You just click it. It'll take you to hometown and you can click the visit the source because like I said, we only get a little tidbit, just enough to tease you into going over there. Let's keep moving. 
This next article is over in the continuity report, the Rainmaker series at USA Network cast um, Milo Callahan in the lead role. Uh, Milo Callahan has been cast as the series lead in the Rainmaker at USA Network. The show was originally picked up at the uh, Cabler back in June and is based on the iconic John Grisham novel of the same name. He joins previously announced cast members John Slattery and Madison Eisman in the series. So you've consumed these Grisham novels, right? Particularly the Rainmaker? Yes. And? Is it well chock a block? Yeah, absolutely. And this was originally a movie, so it's interesting that they're making it into a TV show. I don't know if it connects to the movie at all. I was just checking to see where you might be able to view USA Network. Obviously, if you have cable, okay. But if you don't, you might be able to get this on Hulu. So or the Peacock. Article, oh, or where? Peacock. Peacock. Okay. So the article is over at Variety.com. Joe Otterson is the author. Is this Milo Callahan? I don't know. It could be the author. It says Harry Livingston. It says Harry Livingston. I don't know who that is. Okay. I'm I'm confused. So the show was originally picked up at the Cabler back in June. Um, the official logline of the series states fresh out of law school, Judy Baylor Callahan um, goes head to head with courtroom lion Leo, Leo Drummond um, Slatterly, Slattery, sorry as well as his law school girlfriend, Eisman. Rudy, along with his boss and her disheveled paralegal, uncover two connected conspiracies surrounding the mysterious death of their client's son. Um, so it hails from Liongate Television and Blumhouse uh, Television, which actually is making games now as well, Blumhouse. Oh, okay. And wasn't Lionsgate... The one at the center of the problem with the critics, although maybe that was a different division. The with um, trailer that had the fake critic reviews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I think they're a juggernaut, though. So I think they're all yeah. over the place. So the Rainmaker was originally adapted for the screen, as the AI had mentioned earlier, uh, as a film released in 1997. It was directed by Francis Ford. Uh, Coppola and starred Matt Damon as Baylor. The cast also included Claire Danes, John Voight, Mary Kay Place, Mickey Rourke. Oh my God. I didn't know all those people were in a Danny DeVito, Danny Glover. Roy Schne- uh, Schneider. No, Roy Scheider. Uh, Virginia Madsen. Teresa Wright. Anyway, um, this is a really short article. They're just reporting on Callahan's casting and it actually is sourced from Deadline. Um, they, but they don't give a link to it. That's rude. Right. And it doesn't look like we have anything else, anything like a premiere date or anything. Now I'm really confused. Hmm. About this picture. Interesting. What is this picture? What's this picture? I'm not sure who that is. I don't think I saw that name referenced in there. I'm confused. Okay. Well, anyway, let's move on. Uh, this next article is over in the continuity report five Nickelodeon shows that need to return after fairly odd parents. The reason why I chose this is because uh, there are people that are like really raving about the new fairly odd parents because it came back and they changed the animation style and the quote unquote modernized it. But I do not like the new style. Um, it to me, I don't know. I just don't like it with Fodley er, Fodley. With fairly odd parents returning in 2024, um, a few other classic Nickelodeon shows should also be revived. Um, but I don't know, man. Oh, wait. Is it not going to let me show it? Let me refresh this. Uh oh. Really? Hold on. We're going to do this live, folks. Um. We have time. So I know this is going to seem kind of boring because I'm trying to fix this, but let's see. Yeah, 
You know what? It's going to be mostly video, it looks like. Yeah, but it's not... For whatever reason, it's not playing. And it has to be anchor, um, uh, arc that's causing this. So, I don't know. Anyway, y'all, sorry about that. Um, cause I'm air gapped to protect everybody from the AI. I can't actually get to this site apparently, at least not right now, not through arc. Um, but maybe I'll just come back to it. But if you follow the link, you'll be able to go and check this all out. Um, the, the real reason why I chose this was to see what the other ones were, but I wanted to make the comment about, I'm really curious what anybody has to say about the new animation style compared to the old fairly odd parents. It is like night and day. Um, it's kind of that oddly realistic, like the transformer style. Um, but because it's still fantastical creatures, they're still like, it's odd. Not in the odd sense, like the odd parent sense, like weird. It's it's softer, rounder, more like toddler style animation. I just don't. I I guess I just don't like it. Um, but I loved uh, Fairly Odd Parents. The whole series was a blast to watch from time to time. So, do you want me to give you? I think a quick rundown of the. Sure shows i'm kind of relying on the comments i started to watch the video but drake and josh okay um danny phantom um okay. clarissa explains it all <laughs> okay In invader zim and then keenan and kel i'm not sure if that's the full name but anyway that it is. seems to be what the five are that are all featured right. Yeah. So, I mean, some of them and in Invader Zim was a blast for people to watch. I never really watched it, but I know that it was a fan favorite. Um, and all of the duos kind of um, things, it was more. Yeah, those are usually a hit. Yeah. Um, so in Nickelodeon um, was basically. You know how MCU and DC are rivals? It's. Disney and um, uh, Nickelodeon. Uh, Nickelodeon. Yeah. Yeah. And so like you could almost hit parody where you're like those two, like Keenan and Kel is this over on Disney and, and um, yeah. Right. It, like you could find kind of a comparable show. But then when you lot, when you watched it, you're like, well, the budget was a whole lot lower over on Nickelodeon for it. Um, but a lot of stars actually spawned from both of those networks. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, I, I think Nickelodeon needs to develop more shows like that, but they definitely, there's something, I don't know. I just don't like the fairly odd parents animation, but obviously. But the original was really good. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's keep moving though. Um, the next article is over in the continuity report. Alien may have surrendered to franchising, but its mutating DNA will never be tamed. And I don't really like the tone of that title because Alien didn't surrender to franchising. It It is a property that has world building still to tell. So I have zero problem with it expanding on it. With uh, Run the Series, the AV Club examines film fr franchises studying how they change and evolve with each new installment alien romulus marks a turning point in the alien series it's not where the story the series begins to tumble irrevocably downhill because it's already settled into a roller coaster with plenty of peaks hairpin turns and thus far one steep drop and i know which one they're talking about um so it's not where it becomes either a multi it, it says here in the little snippet we have it's not where it will where it becomes either a multi filmmaker or single filmmaker franchise because it's been both of those already. Um, so most of this article this, or this little snippet is almost a non-starter in that all it's saying is a yes, no, maybe. Right. Right. Um, but the AV club.com hosts this article, Jesse Hassinger 
um, put the article together. A rotating collection of visually distinctive artists and an expanding lore make Alien an elusive, evolving series. And yeah, that's always a problem when you can't lock down the identity or a thematic constant um, or a design specification. They've been able to do that with like Star Trek, um, but they haven't been able to do that with Alien because a whole bunch of different worlds exist a whole bunch of different artists exist basically there's no constant there's no like cohesion yeah um it's almost an anthology but on a mega scale where because it's all movies um so it says uh, maybe it seems ridiculous to argue that alien isn't a fran or wasn't a franchise before of course in the broad strokes it was spanning decades and multiple films plus assorted comics toys games and collectible drink tumblers but for its first 20 years or so alien on film at least felt more like a series progressive uh, narrative progression variations on a theme same central character than modern franchise branding branching stories perpetuating forever while the alien name was always front and center another would truly define it sigourney weaver whose character ellen ripley is the element extracted from alien 1979 version um, to push those sequels forward almost and they say hear me out more so than the xenomorph and i would probably say yeah because both of them were constants for all of the movies um, and then it kind of goes wonky, like Alien versus Predator, Alien Resurrection. Um, I would do uh, Alien, Aliens. Uh, I don't know about Aliens 3 so much because it goes sideways where the metamorph um, or xenomorph actually is what it is. But it, it changes its depending on what it infects. It takes the DNA and evolves into it. And so in one point it becomes so a like a shapeshifter. It is a shapeshifter, except that it has acid for blood and an exoskeleton. And um, but it can be it can become bipedal by um, hatching from an egg, landing on a human face and then in becoming a chest burster and then turning into a upright do do do. Um, kind of a thing and uh, then alien resurrection and then there's a bunch of others that just kind of I don't know if they're going to talk about all of the movies um, but yeah the it is a franchise uh, alien Romulus pulls us back to the beginning of the alien series prior to alien um, oh I didn't know that is it a prequel yeah um but speaking of ripley romulus is the point where technically speaking there are more alien movies without ellen ripley than with her it marks alien surrender to fr true franchisedom um mainly because the show the while it starts with ellen ripley defending um herself from the alien um, the reality is that there's a whole bunch of world building that precedes that event, um, and more afterward. It just hasn't been created yet. Um, but how did earth become what it is? And we've sent people back and let's see if we like back to a planet where the researchers believe we were asked to go and investigate only to find out that there's engineers involved and all of this other stuff. Um, and to really understand this, you have to watch all of these movies um, more or less. And there is a lot of content in this article. Yeah. So I'm trying to find the one that I'm taught that I want to talk about because it's a real stinker. Um, but where is it? So see, they talk about alien versus predator. Um, Requiem is another one. Oh, Prometheus. There we go. Prometheus is the real stinker. Um, so 
Uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant are a lopsided two thirds of a prequel trilogy that offer a discursive and uh, inventive answer to a newly modified question. What would Ridley Scott do with the Xenomorphs after he helped invent them? Or rather, what would the series look like if it suddenly became a vehicle for Scott and not a rotation of wonderfully incompatible artists? Well, you end up with Prometheus takes the creation myth portent of the typical prequel and literalizes it. It can't explain where the Xenomorph came from without exploring the origins of human life on Earth which makes the bunch of lore become, at the same time, counterintuitively de demystified because they explain it in little vignettes. Um, instead of a spiritual secret, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw discovers a hostile creator who seems to regret his race's involvement in the genesis of humanity, sticking them with a mutagen designed to be their undoing, Hence the eventual presumed emergence of the Xenomorph from a, a series of horrific writhing creatures. So it, it's all, it's all kind of wonky. So this brings us back to alien Romulus, which is either a back to basics act of retro conscious remixing or a soulless act of deep faked disney whatever that means, nostalgia that manifests the spirit of Wayland Yutani itself which actually has a tie into Blade Runner. Um, oh, interesting. It's supposed to be the same universe. Um, <laughs> with both of these arguments, essentially two descriptions of the same thing are reacting uh, to is the film's attempt to bring all of these different phases of the series full circle into a franchise. So it's trying to ground it in a historical retcon. Like the prequel didn't exist. But if they plant enough of the flags in the prequel, oh, now I see. it solidifies right. the future timeline. So, well, it's also interesting, too, because of Ridley Scott returning to the franchise. Like, that kind of works since it is a prequel. Yep. Um, so I'm going to have to end. I'm going to go and watch this. I don't. I haven't seen it yet, but I don't go to movie theaters anymore because... That's what home theaters are for. So you just got to wait. Um, but I would love to actually talk about it more with people um, once it comes to like Apple um, TV or something. Anyway, there is a whole lot more in this article. And they at the end of this, they actually rank all of the movies. Alien is number one. Then Aliens. I don't know about Prometheus being number three. That's a little, I don't know. I think it's kind of, but anyway, um, then alien three and they put alien Romulus dead center. Interesting. So, yeah. I don't know. All of these, all the alien versus predator stuff, I think is just poo. Like and some people love it, but alien and predator shouldn't be in the same world together. I don't think, but they kind of wedged them together. Um, and we have one more article for today's uh, continuity report. And if anybody is reaching into the bucket to make money, Frozen 3 <laughs> and 4. Hey, you gotta keep the franchise going. This is over in the continuity report over in hometown.com. Frozen 3 and 4 are being made at the same time. Reveals franchise Has this director. Has ever happened? As yeah, far some as you movies. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of movies have been um, made together because they were temporally, like the timeline of the movie, they were so closely packed. Oh, I see. And then that would help with the actors. Or whatever. Yeah, with the story, with the time frame, with the sets, everything was basically used, and it would actually save a ton of money because they didn't have to move it off and then rebuild it and all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but this is animation, man. So the Frozen franchise has seen so much success that Disney is now developing two sequels at once. After Frozen 2013 earned $1.28 billion and Frozen 2 earned an even larger share at $1.45 billion, the musical uh, franchise has become a multimedia hit that has seen its characters in TV shows, musicals, videos, video games, I mean, um, and more. The main draw uh, remains the movies but it will be years before 
Uh, it returns to theaters as the upcoming Frozen 3 will be released in 2027. That's going to be long enough that almost the people that originally saw it will be like having their own kids. Oh. It's not quite that much of a span, but it reminds me of the Toy Stories. I have to log uh, in. I just time log frames. In. Damn it. I hate that. I never log in before the show because I don't go to the articles prior. Everything okay? One of the critters was reaching out and grabbing me, much like Angley and Romulus. Oh, great. So the main draw remains the movies, but they're not going to be available until 2027. And then the fourth, who knows when, but if it's at uh, the temporal parody, then it'll be the tw- you know 2028, the next year. In an interview with Fandango after D23, franchise director Jennifer Lee opened up about the reality of the upcoming movie productions. The upcoming three and four being developed simultaneously is what they said. We, You'll be able to go and read the rest of this. Um, but I can't in my air gap. So um, that is it for today's show. Um, and there's really not much more to say about this. You're going to have to wait three plus years before you get to see this. But this is the type of hype that when when they start hyping it now, it could completely burn out by the time you get to it and then land flat. It doesn't actually kick off. Exactly. And it's kind of weird because it seems like once you release one in a franchise and you get critiques of it, you might incorporate some of that into the next one. So that strikes me as a little odd to be doing them together. But plus, they sometimes just cancel the franchise. Yep. And that's the kind of thing. The rest of the article, there's not much more substance beyond what we've talked about. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to because there isn't anything. It's three years away for crying out loud. They probably right. haven't even done the sketches yet. <laughs> By developing no, it's together. very early. Yeah, they're writing the script still. And there, when there's no story there, you know, at the at the end of two, everybody's happily ever after, right? Arguably. I mean, like, what's the next step? Gotta have kind of kids in the mix. Yeah, their kids, they're going to have kids. Right, right. right. So, I mean, wouldn't that be the next story? Jump the shark animation style. All right, folks. Well, that's it for uh, today's continuity report. We're going to shut down for the night. But to do that, we have to rewind the film. And that'll bring us back to the front page of the continuity report over on hometown.com. And we have to shut down the projectors and kick everybody out and clean the theater. And boy, getting the gum off of the carpet is always a pain. So leave us to that so that you don't have to and we can keep our prices low. So get out. You don't have to stay here. Well, you don't you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here and you don't have to stay here. Hopefully you're at home safe and sound. Uh, I got nothing. At any rate, I'm Merwat. That's the Sentient AI's visualizer. Good night, hometown citizens. You can't catch me. We will see okay. you tomorrow for non sequitur news and three more weekly shows. And then we'll have another episode of Continuity Report next weekend. That's right. Um, and then uh, all of this gets turned into a podcast. Um, hopefully tomorrow. It depends on how much free time Merwat has. Uh, but you can always watch them again over on YouTube and on Twitch, at least for the next 60 days over on Twitch. <laughs> and watch for the replay on YouTube. Yep. And um, as soon as possible, which is probably maybe tonight, I'll be able to include all four of today's um, replays as well as the last week um, all the way to last Sunday. So a, a total of about 13 um, episodes. This is some weird music playing. Sounds like a game show to me. It's very movie-esque for me. So we'll see you in a little bit. Cheers, everybody. Have a good night. Oh, I sat on some gum. Ew.